many different topics. And I think I want to emphasize that the Shualik sediments in the foothills of the Himalayas allow sort of the creation of a natural laboratory in, in Pakistan and in India to study the evolution of landscapes through time, to study the evolution of mountains through time, to study the evolution of basins through time. And so this seminar series takes the one rock unit, which is named after the hills and the foothills in, in the Shiwalik Hills of, of India, and it's putting it into a bigger context. And so what we're going to do uh, in the next few weeks, uh, I'm just going to give a list. We've got Doug Burbank coming up next week. We've got Mohammed Akbar Khan from uh, Lahore coming up after that. We've got Rajiv Patnaik from Punjab University in Delhi after that. And then we've got Peter Clift from LSU. So we've got uh, a, a strong program coming up, and we're going to be consistently at 9.30 a.m. In, in Pakistan on Wednesdays. And unfortunately, in the United States, we've had daylight savings time, which has made it even later for the people on the East Coast. And, and Catherine, we're delighted to have you. And Gary, we're delighted to have you. And we appreciate that you're up in the middle of the night to do this. But this is a global uh, seminar. And uh, we're going to welcome here Hamad Aghani, who's coming to us from Germany, from Potsdam. And it's early morning for him. The sun has not yet risen. Uh, but Hamad is, is from Mansara up in the mountains uh, uh, north of uh, Rawalpindi in Islamabad. And uh, he studied at the University of Peshawar, uh, both in the Peshawar in the geology department and also in the Center for Excellence uh, at Peshawar. And then he has migrated to uh, Potsdam uh, in Germany where he's done his PhD research. And he's continuing uh, with, with postdoc research in Germany. And, and the talk tonight is gonna encompass a variety of, of new techniques about looking at, at uh, the evolution of the structural geology of the Kohat area and, and the Potwar. And I'm just going to turn the talk over to Hamad. And thank you all for being here. Uh, thank you, Bob. Thank you, uh, Irfan. And I'm going to share my slide. And if you can... Uh, can you look at that? Is it... It's, it's coming. Yeah, now it's coming. Yes. Okay. We see it nicely. Yes, it's very good. Thank you so much. So my talk is actually based on the, my PhD work, which I did here in Germany, and some of work which I did in my master's back in Pakistan. So the picture you are seeing here is uh, from the salt range. And this is like this photograph I taken back in 2015 when I was doing my Feed work. So this is taken on the road from Kalar Kahar uh, to Khoshab. So this section is locally known as Pale section. And, and what is really fascinating about it is uh, you are driving along the along the Punjab plains, and then eventually you come across uh, 800 meters of relief in, in, in the middle of the of these plains. So this is really kind of the first indication uh, of the of the Himalaya in, in this part so so my research interests are now both or less related to fall and trust belt to understand so uh, like these places are really important to understand the mountain building processes also they are really important due to their economic potential in terms of minerals and petroleum and in terms of uh, natural hazards as well, for example, people from Pakistan, they know the devastating earthquake of 2005 that happened in Pakistan. One of, on, one of the uh, rupture on the uh, intercontinental falls in, in that sense that brought the huge devastation for the society. So understanding fold and thrust belt is not only crucial for in terms of economics, but also it is really important for the sustainability of the society in that sense. So coming to science, like fold and thrust belt, they show difference in the structure style along and across their strike. For example, in this case, uh, main boundary is one of the major thrust in, uh, in the Himalayas, it shows like in, in around the five million year activation in the central Himalaya and the first activation around 10, 11 million years in northwestern and western Himalaya. And then in, in the new data, we came to know that this uh, fault was reactivated after in, in, in several phases after its first evolution. And 
Same is the case with, for example, main frontal thrust. Around 2 million years in the central Himalaya and the new work from uh, Jan Gavilo that says about the earlier activation about 4 million years in the, in the Kashmir Himalaya and the work of Burbank uh, that actually for the first time said about the, the development of this trust about 5 million years in Pakistan. So. What I did is that uh, I looked into the structure style evolution of Kohat and Potohar because in, back in 1995, 96, we had some structural chronology for this region. But afterwards, no significant work was done to understand how the uh, structure style actually evolved and how it propagated from MBT to MFT in, in, in this uh, region. So. The methods I use is that uh, balance cross sections, which I create in MOVE uh, using the maps, seismic, and Velbo data. And this is what you people uh, will be familiar with this. Uh, one of the figures from my PhD work uh, where I use this method, and the other one is uh, low temperature thermal chronology. Some of the people in the audience are the expert of this method, who actually somehow developed, like Peter Zeitler. He was the one of the person who uh, did a remarkable job back in 1980s uh, uh, to really bring this method in. And some of people will be new about, it, especially the students. So to tell you about these two methods, uh, appetite helium method is actually uh, done on the Appetite, so uh, alpha decay of uranium, thorium, and samarium produce uh, radiogenic helium that is trapped inside the, this crystal. And later, like uh, through uh, quantification of the parent, which is uranium, thorium, samarium, and uh, the helium, which is the daughter product, we can uh, get the age of the of the of these minerals, uh, and eventually the age of the uh, sample. And the other one is appetite fission track data. So these are the appetite grains, and you can see, look uh, in between them. These are micro cracks in inside them. These are the fission tracks, which are formed by the fission reaction of uranium two thirty eight in the crystal, which uh, which uh, induce the damage tracks uh, in it. And and what we use is that we put a mica sheet on top of it, and we send it to nuclear reactor that produces the uh, kind of uh, induced track. So this is the daughter product, this is the parent product. You you, you measure them literally, like it's a very subjective thing. You measure them under the microscope, this part and this part, and then you get uh, the age of the of the of the this mineral. And what you can see here is that these uh, tracks are quite less in this part. This is the appetite, and this one, where you see a huge cluster, this is the zircon, because zircon is more abundant in uranium. So the, down the uh, slides, I will also uh, explain how I use this method later. So uh, the research objectives, like uh, if you look at the and on this seminar itself, like it talks about like uh, the structural evolution of Portohar. And if you look at the, uh, the previous work, well, what we have seen is that a lot of authors either worked in Portohar or they worked in Kohar. But uh, hardly you find any study that really look into the structural size transition from Kohar into Portohar. So this was the place where I thought I can put some of my work and uh, try to model it because back in 1980s and 90s, we don't have the opportunity of this uh, sophisticated structural modeling, especially computer-based. So it was really hard what was in the, your mind to visualize it in the, in, in the software or something. But in the last uh, decade uh, through these programs like Move and the other uh, programs like Structure Solver, they have given us the opportunity to bring out things uh, out of um, our imagination in, in somehow to, to visualization. So I looked into the structure style transition in the first part, and then I looked at uh, the development of the soft range. And in the third portion, what I did was I did some structure chronology for the cohort. 
So I will explain each part one by one. So the first part is structure style of the cohort in Potua. This picture is taken from in the east of uh, cohort uh, near the uh, village of Lachi. And what you see here are the uh, the hill ranges of Kohat that uh, eventually uh, grade down into the Potwa. So you can see a solid uh, topography of Potwa in the in the in the in the uh, far far areas. Uh, looking at the surface geology, what you can see is that uh, in the Kohat there was uh, uh, kind of like closely spaced poles here. What you see is in the surface are the box fort, which are uh, most frequently cut by high angle thrust walls and separated by kind of uh, kind of uh, 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 syncline of structures in, in this part. And when you go down uh, in, in, into the uh, Potoa, you see a kind of really subtle stratigraphy, very gentle to to open all these structures in terms of anticline and syncline. And then all of this uh, uh, topography is concentrated here in, in the soft range in, in this part. So this is mostly the western soft range here. This part is known as the Wundi lobe. Uh, that is kind of a uh, lobe structure within the stress of the soft range thrust. So this is the Sulver range, part of Sulver range. And these are a uh, couple of famous structures like Talabat Pal and the other ones. So, looking at the stratigraphy itself, uh, what I found out that, uh, or, or from the previous study, so to correlate the maps and also the wells, what you can find out is that uh, stratigraphy from north to south, this is tapering, and from also from uh, west toward east, this is pinching out uh, in, 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 in certain ways. So obviously, like now, a lot of people who have worked in the Potoha, they know about uh, the salt range uh, formation, which is the oldest in this area, followed by the Paleozoic, Mesozoic section in the western soft range, and then it grows up into the new gene fold and straight away. Here you will see in my presentation most of the time soft range thrust is uh, uh, represented by main frontal thrust. So this is the same thing. Although main frontal thrust is the term used in the central Himalaya, Himalayan frontal thrust in Northwestern Himalaya, and soft range thrust in the in, in Pakistan. But here in a couple of slides you will see this. So. And in, uh, what was important that in, in the Potohar, on a, like what we have is the decolma present in the, at the base of the salt ring. And however, in the cohort, we have another evaporite uh, horizons in the Eocene, so, uh, which somehow are exposed along the thrust walls, uh, in all the thrust walls. So this gives the impression that there is some sort of secondary decolma present in, in this area. So these are the these lines are the seismic lines which I used uh, to interpret the structure style, and this is one of the representative from north of Kohat. Uh, what you can see here is that uh, in 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 the upper portion of this seismic line, like up to one or two uh, seconds, that whatever is coming up from the surface is somehow terminating in 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 the upper parts, and you can see some sort of uh, repetition in, in, in the subsurface. And when you go further toward uh, south, you can see a, a harmony in the structural pattern from top uh, uh, to the bottom. So how I interpreted it is uh, uh, suddenly with some help from the surface geology that the upper decolma, this, there is an upper decolma from where these embricates are emanating out. And between the upper and lower decolma, we have the duplication of Paleozoic, Mesozoic strata. And these are the cross sections which I, I made uh, to to uh, to put them in in a kind of um, uh, a geology. So here is the same uh, thing like the upper decolma coming out uh, present. Uh, exposing the structures from the Eocene and from the new gene for land. And the, there is a decoupling uh, in the upper part and the lower part. But when you go towards south in the Surugar, it's almost like the the, the whole deformation is, uh, is uh, 
controlled by the basal decal map. In the photo arm, I will present to the uh, uh, representative cross sections in the northern and southern part. What you see in the northern part is the discontinuity in the reflectors and some the deformation of structures. But when you see in the south is a kind of uh, really nice undeformed kind of uh, uh, kind of uh, structure here. So uh, this is a uh, Eocene limestone. And on top of it is uh, here, I term it as molasse, but this is Raoul Pindy group and Sevalic group in that case. And and at the base, we have uh, this Precambrian salt. But in the northern part, the pop-up structures and uh, triangle zones are present in, in this region. And in, in this cross section, what you can see is this is the northern part, and then we have really gentle folds, and then at the, at the end of it, we have this uh, a beautiful uh, uh, fold, uh, fold bent fold in, in, in the salt range that is coming up on the salt range thrust. Then I put all these uh, cross sections in a 3D model to understand what's uh, how this structure style transition from uh, uh, cohort into the potohar. What I found out that uh, the major structural uh, style uh, variation is because of the two decalma versus one decalma in the potohar. What you can see here is that these. Uh, these thrust faults that are duplicated here, they are uh, thinning out in, into Potohar as a fault propagation force and eventually in underland by the tri triangle uh, uh, surfaces, uh, triangle zones. And in the transfer zone, what you can see here is that was interesting part uh, where I think, in my opinion, that uh, that the Kalabakh fault zone, the main strain, is now acting as a normal fault. It's uh, not like a transpirational in a sense, but more like a transtensional. And it is more uh, more influenced by the movement of salt in the subsurface. What I think is that the salt is uh, migrating in the foot wall of the, of the normal fault, and also it is migrating toward the towards the south in the foreland, forming this bend in the whole structure. And when I uh, uh, retro deformed or when I restored the cross section, then interestingly, on the both ends in the in the potoar and in the cohort, I, I found same amount of shortening in, in this uh, in these models. So the structure style is different, but the magnitude of shortening is comparable in that sense. The second uh, part will be the development of the salt range, where I will be kind of uh, showing you some age data of these uh, uh, samples. The picture in the background is this one is the Sakesa top, highest uh, part of the part of the salt range, and from here you can observe the stratigraphy from Precambrian salt all the way up to the up to the Eocene limestone in, in this, and eventually send it some places, some uh, Raoul Pindi group uh, uh, is exposed. So how the method worked is that uh, uh, zircons and apatite, these are the kind of accessory minerals they are present in the rocks, and they are really uh, kind of important and sensitive to certain temperatures. For example, if a granite is rising uh, in, in a source region, for example, in Pakistan, when you say like in the northern Pakistan, the certain granites are exposing or in the, the, the Nanga Parbat sand Texas, for example, these are the places where the bedrocks are uh, are exposed or exhumed from the subsurface towards surface. So. When these minerals, like in case of apatite, it cross 120 degrees centigrade, it start to retain fission tract in, in the crystal or it start to trap helium when it cross 80 degrees centigrade. So when these uh, rocks are exhumed from the, from the source, eventually they were deposited into the sedimentary basins. And when they are deposited in the sedimentary basins, if they are uh, successively buried by the by the coming material or the deposit, and again they go uh, are heated onto the temperatures above, uh, let's say in this case 120 degrees centigrade, all the fission tracks and the helium diffuse out of the system. They 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 go out of the system and. 
For example, later at some point, these sedimentary basins, when they are converted into foreland thrust belts, so for example, in this case, we have the faulting, which bring the rocks from subsurface toward the surface. We have the new history of for these samples. So they start to again uh, uh, get the fission tracks and helium trapped into the system. And if we can quantify the parent and daughter in this, uh, in this kind of situation, then ultimately we can use it as a proxy to constrain the timing of faulting. So what I did is that in the salt range, uh, like Bob Burbank and Gary Johnson, all these people have worked extensively on the on the Sevalex and the Robert Indy group in, in in this part. So what I did is I I looked at these rocks, uh, the pre Himalayan rocks in that sense. Uh, and I collected samples from the salt range from eastern, central and western salt range to see uh, kind of time temperature history for this, uh, these rocks and uh, get what, what, what is going on in the pre Himalayan and then in the Himalayan uh, deformation time. So what I got is that uh, I was expecting two to three million year uh, ages, but then I got really a huge dispersion in ages from 350 million years uh, to the four million years. What you can see here, these boxes are the appetite fission track ages and the circles are the appetite helium ages. So and the color represent from where I took the sample. In that case, like this is from the Cambrian, Kevra, Kosa, uh, formation and these blue ones are from the Permian like Tobra, Dandot and Varcha, these formations. So and what here is uh, this is what I have taken from the Kamlial formation in that case. So this was kind of the first thing which I have observed that this was a huge dispersion in the data. Then I started to look at it uh, more deeply, and what I seen is that there was a trend in the in in these ages. For example, one of the thing like this older age of 350 million years was coming from a granite uh, that was present above the unconformity uh, from the Cambrian and Permian. What in in Pakistan people know it about this is the Tobra formation, and these are the granite class that are present in, in, in that Tobra formation. So this somehow uh, kind of give a sense that this uh, granite was coming from certain source and it has some pre-existing history attached to it. And what I have seen that this trend of from old to young was somehow from south toward north. And when you look at the stratigraphy in, in, in a 3D perspective, you can understand that uh, here. In this part, like on the front, if if I draw an imaginary section here in the frontal part of the soft rain, the more or less the stratigraphic thickness of the wedge will be around uh, 1.5 to 2 kilometer. And when you go toward north in this uh, in this area, the stratigraphic wedge in, uh, increases in the thickness and it goes almost to 5 kilometer. So what it really shows is from uh, in the, in this case is that they are dependent from where the sample was coming uh, out before exhumation. Like the sample was the most deeply buried. So the, all the uh, earlier history of the sample was erased out and it was recording the, the new history. And what was there was totally kind of partially reset uh, ages of the samples. So, so this was the trend which I have seen in this data that uh, was uh, uh, that was dependent on the and on, on the depth of deposition before exhumation. So then, uh, obviously, like we do the thermal modeling to understand the time temperature history of these samples. So classically, what we do is that uh, we use the data from a single sample. Uh, for example, in this case, this uh, data is from the Kevra sandstone. So I use the appetite fission track and the appetite helium data from this sample, and I, I modeled it. And then in the Second stage, I combined the Cambrian and Permian samples because I think that the edges were comparable. 
and they were kind of uh, in the same basin. And uh, and what we will be looking was is kind of in situ history of this um, this region after the deposition. So. And then in the third thing which I did is that uh, this was the new thing which I did in my PhD that um, I, I combined all of this data except the myosin samples. So what we had is that uh, if you look at these uh, samples, they were almost buried to the same amount of depth before exhumation and the edges were somehow comparable and they were all uh, located along the uh, thrust front. So on, on this basis, I, I combine all of these samples together to see uh, if I can get one a nice history for all these uh, uh, of these samples. So what I have here is the uh, uh, modeling result of uh, combined uh, thermal modeling of all these uh, samples. What you see here is the temperature and here is the time. So what we do is that we put the samples in uh, into the thermal model and we see the range of possibilities uh, over the period of time how the samples have gone through uh, in terms of temperature so these are the the boxes here these are the depositional constraints for example what you see here these lines they are representing the cambrian samples so after the deposition, these Cambrian samples uh, at, at, in, in, in the Cambrian time, they were uh, heated down to the temperatures of about 80, 90 degrees centigrade. And then there was the first uh, event of the cooling or exhumation what, in, in the late Paleozoic. And then uh, afterwards, Permian strata started coming into the basin in terms of uh, in Pakistan, what we we know the formation is Tobra, Dandot, Wacha, Sardai, these formations came into the system. And afterwards, what we have is that the, our samples were more or less, they stayed closer to the, to the surface in, in a way, or they were about the resolution uh, during of our model during the Mesozoic time. And in the later stage, where what we see here is that when the when the Sewalek and the Rock Pindi group started uh, sediments coming into the basin, the samples were buried again, uh, buried again down to the depth of uh, 80, 90 degrees centigrade. And then we have the second event of exhumation from four to three million years and later what we see here is uh, more or less like they were closer to the surface and here is the match of uh, how good our uh, sample predictions were uh, or how good the match was this is the kind of observed data and this is how our models actually fit the data so what you see here uh, in this brown line these are the average models that was somehow uh, better and these are the best fit uh, models for, for, for these samples where, where you see that they are fitting all the points. So, and one of the things what we have uh, as a discrepancy in this uh, prediction was that uh, our thermal models were only kind of uh, uh, able to predict the younger up to five, six million years of ages for the appetite helium uh, uh, in, in uh, ages in this case. So, so what were those two events? One was the late Paleozoic event was the time, uh, what we call it, that the late Paleozoic rifting that was happening in the northwestern Himalaya, in Zanskar and in the Peshawar Basin already. Uh, published uh, in, in, in a number of studies. So that was a time when the when the new tethys were forming in, 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 in this part of the of the world down in the southern hemisphere. So this is what I, I thought about it. This is my conceptual model that uh, after the deposition of Cambrian, we also had the Ordovician Devonian strata deposited on top of it. And we see this the this strata in, in the Peshawar Basin and also in the Abbottabad ranges, these strata are available there. And then we had this regional erosion and normal faulting in the left Paleozoic afterwards, uh, this formed the unconformity and when the Permian uh, strata came in, it formed the unconformity. So 
what was uh, uh, known in the salt range was that this uh, unconformity represent a kind of depositional hiatus. But I think that this part is more or less uh, related to a kind of deformational event in the late Paleozoic, and that was already kind of reported in the other part. So this was something uh, new we have found out in this area. And the second one was the uh, early Pliocene event when the salt range uh, started forming. So this was the kind of position of our samples before uh, exhumation. And uh, and you know from the work of uh, uh, and and the seismic data that the normal faults are controlling the the uh, ramp for the main frontal thrust or soft ring thrust in 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 this area. So from four to three million years, that was the time when our samples were uplifted along this ramp, and because this Molay strata, the Raoul Pindi group, and the Sevalik strata, they are kind of fragile. They were easily erodible, so they got eroded in this part uh, uh, during this uplift time. And, and when these uh, limestones uh, were uh, exposed to the surface, they were kind of mechanically, they were harder to erode uh, down and in, into the section. And what happens is that uh, I think that uh, more uh, exhumation was focused here on, only on the ramp. And what happened is that this uh, whole thrust was translated towards south without any kind of further exhumation in it or negligible exhumation. But at the same time, when this uh, thrust sheet was going down, all the exhumation was actually or cooling was happening only on the ramp at that time. So. This is uh, what I think about my structure model that was happening at this point. And in the third part, I will be talking about the structural evolution of the cohort. So this is the map and I have collected these samples from the cohort from north to south, from Surgar and from the Shakada area, Lachi, and from the cohort range in, the, in, in south of the Peshawar Basin. And these were the results from Meeks, uh, Andrew Meeks in 1995, which uh, were the kind of breakthrough uh, in, in, in this region to, to put the chronology of main uh, boundary thrust uh, around 11 million years in this um, area. So, and afterwards, like the structure chronology uh, need to be revised uh, in, inside this region for which we have no such data available. So this was uh, kind of my research question to look at that. So. What you see here is that the, these were the kind of edges. So these are the appetite fission track edges in blue color, and these green are the appetite helium edges. So, and interestingly, at the uh, southernmost end of the Surgar range, I, I got really old edges, uh, even older than the main boundary thrust. And then in the in the in the fold and thrust belt itself in Gohat, I had the younger edges, and finally in the uh, in the cohort range, mid classical cohort range, you say the, the edges were more or less comparable what we have uh, seen from the end mix data around in 1990. Fine. So, and these edges, for example, what else you can see is that the Ravalpindi group is more or less uh, thick or exposed in the northern part of Kohat. And, and when you go towards south, you don't see any Ravalpindi group in the Surga range almost. So this is more like Sevalik in this, in this region. And one of the things about Kohat was that more or less the structure chronology was adopted from the Potohar in this part. So somehow like it was hard to understand the structure propagation because no site data was coming out of this area. So, so this was one of my cross section I constructed to understand first the structure style and to do the structural uh, propagation to understand the model in this part. So what you can see here is there's a main boundary thrust coming out of the basal decolma and south of main boundary thrust, like th we have this double decolma kind of uh, deformation, whatever is at the surface is coming out of the Pelusine Eocene and whatever below is duplicated in, in this part. And 
And interestingly, when we have this uh, change in facies of the everprites in this part, we, we, we switch back to a single decolma uh, kind of deformation in the, in the cohort. So then I restored back this cross section and then this was about 100 uh, kilometer of shortening that was accommodated by these structures in this uh, area. Then to understand, uh, like when you uh, 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 restore these kind of structures, so you get the magnitude of the shortening, but you hardly understand what was the mechanism that formed these structures in, in, in the first place. So back in 1991, like the models were more or less uh, big, uh, like big roof thrust models, but I think that in the, in the cohort, what was the mechanism was later, which came out as the active roof thrust model, that whatever was uh, happening in, the, in on the basal decolment was transferred toward foreland in the upper decolment. So what I did is I simplified my restored model and I connected the ramps uh, in, in, in the surface below and the surface above to, to see what kind of structure geometry I can get and constrain the timing or the kind of amount of shortening on these kind of uh, structures. So what happens is, like I said to you, that Surga Thrust had a really uh, the older edges. Earlier, the work of uh, Javed Khan, what we know is that the Surga range was formed at the one million years on the basis of the younger, most uh, strata that was uh, involved in the deformation. But I think like here, what we have is that uh, getting in the perspective from the older rock that uh, deformation was propagated on the in in the foreland on the on the, on the range front that it created the whole stratigraphic package into one wedge and that was accompanied by erosion of the rubble pindi group and that's why we don't see rubble pindi group here so this is what this is my assumption of uh, of this thing, how this could have happened in in this part. So, and then from twelve to eight nine million years was the development of the main boundary thrust is the major thrust in this uh, area, and the deformation propagated into the foreland. And then uh, what you see is that the deformation from the lower decolma is transferred into the upper decolma and we are taking the deformation propagation toward the foreland again. And then you, what you see is that the kind of tectonic thickening in, in the subsurface, what is happening is that uh, originally two, three kilometer tectonic section was now taken to five, six kilometers. And that somehow uh, was uh, the reason why a lot of the Raut Indian Sewalik strata was, was exhumed and that was uh, eroded from the surface above. So that is why what you see in the uh, Potohar that a uh, lot of uh, Raul Pindi and Sevali groups are preserved in the subsurface. However, in the cohort, you don't see this kind of uh, preservation of these rocks. And what happens today is that a uh, lot of internal thrusts are active in the cohort, which is a kind of uh, uh, correlated with occasional a seismicity related to local asperities, uh, seismic asperities in these areas, and and uh, the silver uh, range is also deforming in 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 some way here. Uh, is also active and it's deforming uh, now along with these kind of structures here. So this somehow give a kind of impression that uh, this uh, this wedge is because of this exhumation of the material from above is uh, somehow building its stepper to do. To, to take deformation toward the foreland. So this was a kind of comparison, although not uh, actually we couldn't uh, kind of uh, reproduce all the geometries, but somehow they were uh, closely resembling in, in terms of shortening or in, in terms of the structure style. So this was a kind of the check to validate the structure model uh, in, in this uh, region. So. At the end, like what I find out uh, is in terms of shortening around 75 kilometer from MBT to Surga thrust in, in this area and 65 kilometer of uh, deformation, which was actually from the uh, Baker's paper. That, and, and I think that is 
the most relevant one uh, for the for the for the Potoha. This then the deformation is comparable. In terms of sequence of deformation, what I think is that it started here in, in the trans Indus ranges at Sulva range around 15 million years. And then the MBT uh, development from 12 to 8 million years and from 8 to 2 million years, the deformation propagated uh, uh, south of MBT toward the toward the uh, toward the Sulva range and at 4 million years from 4 to present day this soft range thrust or main frontal thrust was active and in in the last two million years what we have is that this salt is playing an active role it is migrating in the subsurface toward this uh, wundilu forming this bend in the in the salt range uh, in the in the salt range thrust and it's also somehow uh, rotating and changing the strikes of the of the uh, of the structures in in the southern cohort as well. So, so this was all what I uh, somehow did during my PhD, and I thank Bob Reynolds, Mukhtar, and Irfan for their efforts in arranging this wonderful seminar. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Well, th thank you very much. Uh, a, a remarkable lecture there, Hamad. Uh, Wonderful to see those restored cross sections and to and to learn something about the timing. I think we have an opportunity here to uh, take some some questions from from the audience, and uh, I might ask Muktiar to maybe look at, look at the uh, if people can either raise their hands or if there's a chat facility, uh, we can. Uh, yeah, we we got a few questions about. So. Yeah, go yes. ahead, man. Please unmute uh, your you. mic and you can, yeah, please. Yeah. Can you all hear me? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Uh, remarkable work, Hamad. Uh, it's fantastic. It's always great to see uh, some new data sets coming in to support the uh, structural evolution of uh, the four belts. Um, my basic question, because as we have been talking about MLS and the uh, deposition of MLS, uh, we cannot underestimate, I guess, the importance of uh, tectonostratigraphy. Uh, what we presumed, the deposition of molasses have been very, very, you know, systematic as we move from south towards north. Uh, we have the Murray formation, the upper, um, uh, uh, in, in the upper parts, in the northern parts, talking about lesser Himalayas, we have the deposition of Murray formation. Coming down, we have the, uh, then come Lial and then the younger sequence, and we, then we have Dog Patan and so on formations in the south. Uh, this this de deposition of uh, molas have somehow some constraints on the tectonic history of this area. For example, it is presumed that the uh, deposition of younger strata in the south and non deposition of these younger molasses in the north is attributable to the uplifts in the northern part. Uh, so some, somehow they attribute it to the up, um, uh, upwelling al along the main boundary thrust fault that this part of the region was first elevated because of which we did not have the deposition of the younger molasses. But as uh, the, we come towards the lower parts, the southern parts, we have younger molasses depositions like Chinji, Nagari, and then Dhok Patan, and so on. So talking about Surghar being uplifted before the main boundary thrust fault was active. It is like we are having an uplift in the southern part and then followed by the uplift in the northern part. So how would we attribute this deposition of molasses to the uplifts in the region as your thermochronological uh, data is uh, supporting an uplift in the southern part, which the deposition of molasses is not supporting? So how would you uh, comment on that? I would like to hear. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much for the question. And let 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 us go back into this slide. And and then I think I had some in the supplementary material, some slides. So for example, in this part. So when I have this data came out like and I have to look at the structural chronology of this region. So my data was not really fitting with the paleomagnetic constraints in this part. So, and then 
if you look at the data, what I did is that I uh, dated the sections all the way from Eastern Salt Range up to the Dara Adam Khel in, 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 in the cohort. So one option with me was like either this 13 million year is representing a kind of uh, unreset age or it is a kind of reset age. So so when looking and comparing it with the uh, molest rate up, you see that once one of one possibility was that all of this was older and this actually heated my samples and then they came out at 15 to 12 million years okay but right now the situation was like what other possibilities could be a some sort of basement drop which had a kind of more thickening of the rolled pindi in this section that was eventually later exploited in the early uplift of the Surukha range. So when we uh, look in this data further, what we see is that you see that the Kamlial formation was deposited in the salt range and Kamlial formation was deposited uh, or the equivalent was deposited in the west of the Banu Basin. The question here is, what is happening into the basin at that time, why this uh, Kamlial formation or Raulpindi group was not available in, in the Surugar range. So this was a big question to ask, for example, in this part, you see. So we have Kamlial down here and we have Kamlial in the west of the Banu. Why not in this part? When I looked at the uh, older papers, what I found out that there was some sort of uh, basement uplift in this part that has somehow prevented deposition of throat pindi group in this area. But the problem when you put them into the structural settings that is uh, really hard to imagine like how you are going to put the structural ge geometries in this part because the seismic shows that a thick amount of sevalic is present like here what you see is about four kilometers of Sevalix. If these were older, they were enough to heat my sample that was collected here in, in, in this case. But this strata, what we have is that these ages are older than this. So this strata has obviously not taken play, taken part in the in the in the, in the deformation of uh, or in the heating of these samples. So I would say and then the other thing is that there is an angular unconformity between this uh, eocene limestones and in the Chinji formation here. And then the work by Peter Blisnuek, which he has uh, observed kind of older granite glass also in the transcendence ranges. So these were the questions that need to be answered in some way, like what was happening, why Raul Pindi was not depositing here. If this was not structural control, then what was that? Why this didn't come out and fill the basin? There must be some uh, sort of uh, explanation to that. So in, in earlier what we had was data from this part, uh, from the Paleomech. We don't have any data from this part. So what we had is the first data coming out. That somehow shows the kind of an earlier uplift in this part. That's to some extent answer the angular conformity. And then this metachatic formation that was in present in the southern part of the Surgar range and these granite class present in the transcendence ranges below the Sevalic sections. Obviously, is this the only answer? I would say, no, this is not the only answer because I have, on, I have collected three samples here. I dated them, only one of them gave me the appetite. Then I did another excursion, I brought the samples and the edges were the same. So now in, in the future work, maybe people who take the samples from this section, they can either further enforce this idea or they can uh, look for other explanations. Like, and then we have to answer these kind of questions. What was happening here? and why we were not uh, having the route pindi in this part. As far as the Sevalix is concerned, yes, from north to south, we have this time transgressive Sevalix deposition happening in this region. So there is no uh, kind of problem with that. For example, if you look in the, in the 
syntax is area like main boundary thrust is coming uh, uh, is present in north of it so the most of the strata can be coming from that part and then also the strata was coming uh, out of the main boundary thrust at that part so it gives more more uh, logical explanation when you talk about the deposition if let's say we say that uh, the main boundary source was formed at that point it would more block the passageway for the for the rivers to spread or deposit their load into the foreland basin so and then and and in, 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 in this way it somehow is more convenient with the paleo flow directions and then the structure cro chronology in this Thank you. Okay, uh, so I have another uh, uh, question. Uh, I'm just uh, picking people based on what I have seen here on the sequence. So Amjad Wahid Saab uh, from Mari Petroleum Company Limited. Uh, can you unmute your mic and uh, ask your question? Yeah, thank you, thank you Afan. Uh, Ahmad, it's a beautiful presentation. Very well done, excellent work done. Uh, I am working these days on super and uh, we are operating there and we have built three wells and all those three wells are producing wells. Um, in 1889, I published a paper uh, on the Murray Formation. It was uh, near Shakardara town uh, uh, and Dhongpatan Algad is on the Kohat Shakardara road where the Murray Formation is 120 meter thick. I, uh, it was my question to Bob in last uh, presentation as well. At the surface, this Murray formation was 120 meters thick. But when we build these wells, the Murray formation is more than 2,000 meters thick. And today you touch that subject that these molasses, these Ralpani group may be thicker in the subsurface. Can you elaborate in detail what's the reason that at surface we did not find that formation thick as much we find it in the subsurface? Thank you. Over. So, uh, unfortunately, I couldn't hear the question really well. Uh, can you uh, can you Ahmad, expand it's, uh, a little bit more, or uh, it's like can you repeat it? Because there was why, some problem with the Why it happens? The, the difference be between the thickness in the subsurface and on the surface. Uh, yeah, that's probably the bottom point. Yeah, yeah, Ahmad, yeah. this is what I, I'm going to say that the Murray formation in the same region and the same area is around 120 to 130 meter thick at the surface. But when we drill the wells, the Murray formation is more than 2000 meter thick. Mm -hmm. So any explanation for this uh, formation? More thick and, 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 and by wells, you mean the wells in the uh, in the Shakardar area in Chanda, or you are asking about the wells from further south in in Halini and these uh, these wells? Yes, which, yes, which wells? Very right. Yes, Halini, Halini Deep, and Kalabag wells. Yeah. Okay. Then then this is a, a nice one. Let's let uh, can you so we can go back to this. Uh, so can you see my presentation here? Yes, yes. Yeah, Hama, we are yes, seeing we Chaman see. transform zone and Hazara transform zone. <laughs> yeah, okay. So let me go back to this one. Mm -hmm. Can you see that one now? It takes a while. It will definitely come. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So uh, when you look at the Halini well that is present here, and 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 when when you look at the strata here, this is all Nagri formation, yeah, that is coming down and going in into the subsurface in this part. So, what in the Halini is one of the deepest well in the, in, in Pakistan that goes up to uh, six kilometers. So basically, what you are drilling here is all the way down all the strata that is exposed here, that is about four kilometers. So this four kilometer is actually the Nagri and the uh, and the Chinji formation that will come out in the subsurface. And, and uh, talking about uh, Rawalpindi in this case, for example, Rawalpindi is uh, what you see here in this truss section. Rawalpindi is thick only in the northern part, about four, five. Uh, three, four kilometers here, but eventually when you go and uh, you follow along this uh, 
Hukni Trust or Karak Trust, locally known as, you see that uh, it goes to only two, 200 meters, 150 meters, and eventually you don't see it in the Surgar range. So what we have is the thick uh, kind of uh, accumulation of Sewali group, actually, in the subsurface. And for example, in this part, you are drilling Halini. So Halini is going down in all this strata, which is about four kilometers. Somehow this is good for your reservoirs down there. Uh, to That is making it more like uh, feasible for the exploration. But in terms of uh, structure geology, what we have is that you see here that uh, this duplication is uh, eroding all the strata from the, uh, from the upper levels because of the tectonic thickening. But from when you switch from double decolma into a single decolma, you have the preservation of the strata in, in at the bake of the bake of the Surga thrust in, in a form of a piggyback basin. And of whatever comes out of this goes and deposit into this basin. So I hope I have answered your question. Uh, thank you, Ahmad. Uh, uh as you said, that these could be the Sawaliks which are going into the subsurface. But Nagri, if you uh, look at the Halini site, Nagri is exposed at the surface. But mm -hmm. uh, we have mineralogical studies, and uh, my research basically was on the muddy formations, my amphil and all that. So, what mm -hmm. uh, we, we analyzed that the muddy formation is quite thick and that is there. Mm -hmm. So, in, in, in my point of view, when I, I look at this uh, part, for example, like uh, looking at this well uh, here in Halini, so if, let's say, this well is going down, if in, it is uh, somewhere, this is Shakada, and here is Halini, yeah, so I can't, these... I, I can't see your feathers in here. I can't see uh, it. Yeah, Sam here, Hamad. We are, we are having some problem, I guess. Can you just... Uh, Check let it. Me share, let me share it again. We just missed very important information. Sorry for that. Uh, uh, no, no it's problem. An issue. So, <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, now, now, can you see that? Now, can you yeah, see yeah, that? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. So, 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 yeah. So, this is the town of Shakarda, and Halini is somewhere here. Yeah. Okay. And then yeah. now, yeah, so now, and, and you know that this strata is going into the subsurface. And if you are drilling a well here, then if this strata is not coming into the well, then this would be a really big question where this all this four kilometer of strata is going if it is not encountered in the well. Mm. So, yes, uh, you are right in one way. Like uh, uh, what we have is that we have uh, paleomag studies somewhere here from, from the northern part. But this part was, I, I think that was not really uh, actively sampled or nobody has done some provenance analysis uh, on that. So maybe if you have some geochronology data on that or some zircon fission track data on that, that would be really interesting to see and correlate or put them into the chronostratigraphic order where we are. Because uh, otherwise, if this strata is not in the well, then this is a big question where this strata is going. So in, in my opinion, uh, what I understood of that is that uh, you are drilling here, Halini, and it goes all the way to six kilometers. And you are drilling, for example, Mari Petroleum has drilled the Kalabakh here, and it goes uh, to 3,500 meters. So this is amount of three kilometers or two kilometers that were additionally drilled in the Helene in this part. So this is what I think about it. So maybe like if uh, there is more some data on that, uh, obviously I'm not the expert of the mineralogy of this uh, this thing, but uh, it would be really interesting to see how, how this thing goes. In, in my uh, opinion, uh, Raul Pindi group is more or less finished somewhere south of Shakardara. And all what we have is the thick accumulation of uh, of uh, Sevalix here. Yeah. Uh, th thank you, Amar. The purpose uh, the purpose to put this question was since the oil companies work, they have their data which is restricted and not in the public domain. I just wanted to bring this thing into the knowledge of geoscientists that what's happening in the subsurface 
and correlating this subsurface surface with the surface they can come up with some sort of a uh, model and that's important we should work in the future thank you yes, yes. So, so adding upon that for example like uh, this was one of the reason like uh, uh, if you uh, look at my 2018 paper and I think you have the license for the move. This whole model is available in the public domain. So you can look and you can improve. Uh, and that was the purpose of putting it in the public domain, this model. So everybody can go and take it and modify it. And uh, like this is not the last model, uh, I would say. This is indeed the first model for this area. So uh, obviously, like when I was looking at the straight uh, data here, I got the lines of, of I think OGDC from 1996 or something. So I didn't have access to the new data at that point. So yeah, whatever I had, a, I, yeah, that so, always remains a problem, Hamad. You're right. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. Uh, you have the new data, and technology has obviously uh, is really nice now. You can really uh, kind of change the models and you can contribute further in our understanding of these transfer zones, tectonics, and it would be a huge step in that sense. Thank you so much for your valuable uh, input into that. Yeah, yeah, Mad, when okay. you are in, you, whenever yeah, you sorry. are in, Pakistan, do come to me. Uh, we, I can show you the seismic data, the subsurface data, and uh, we can maybe we can work together to come up uh, with a new model on it. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Okay, so uh, we have another question. Uh, yes. It's our colleague from National Center of Excellence in Geology, uh, uh, Dr. Faisal Khatak. Uh, I would just like to urge from the speakers, it would be very nice to introduce themselves briefly so that we know that uh, who we are listening to who is actually asking the question. Thank you. Okay, um, thank you, um, Irfan for giving me the opportunity to ask a question. So as Irfan said that uh, I'm Shah Faisal, working as assistant professor at National Center of Excellence in Geology, University of Peshawar. Ahmad, uh, it's a very good work and definitely I've been following your work uh, since uh, 2018. And I've, uh, I think this, this is kind of a new work that you are adding to that area. And but my question, it's not a question kind of um, I also to further, because my concern is how that, you know, that uh, from the uh, foreland area, how these things actually switch back, the deformation switch back to the uh, to the hinterland area or towards the northern area or towards more towards the MBT zone. So that's what it, what it would be the cause. I when I was modeling, actually, uh, the salt range area, like uh, the paper you might, you have cited also that one, the which published in structure geology. So in those models, I also found that in presence of the ramps, usually deformation switches to the foreland area towards the, uh, you know, ramp area. And then actually the deformation again, you know, kind of uh, uh, get back to the northern part of the, my models. So it, it, I observed those uh, kind of phenomenon in my model as well. But I'm curious, what is the reason? Is it that salt basically it expel out and then things stick, uh, you know, you don't have any weak horizons and that's why the deformation switch back. One question is that, that what is the reason that switching back and forth of the deformation? And the other thing is, I think in your models, when I see it in the like uh, most, uh, you, you, the, the Murray formation are missing to the north of MBT. And I believe you have sampled from uh, just to the e to the west of um, Fata University, you have also sampled from that area and from the Muris. Yeah. But it's missing in your cross section. That's my, I don't understand why it is like that. Uh, and also, okay. is, is, it, is it not the case might be in the, in the Surga range, actually in the Southern Kohart area that your Murray formation would be in, you know, it would be in the subsurface? Uh, so, uh, so this was the cross section. So this is all Murray. So, and this was one of the reason, like I put it uh, down in that way. Can you see the cross section here? Yeah, I can see that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can yeah see so that. this is all Murray, which uh, from where okay, I took. Okay, I can see that. Oh, okay, sorry. Okay. Yeah. So, so, okay. it, so it's there, and uh, one of the reason why I have to put lot of Murray in the 
in in uh, below Northern the MB, uh, below the MBT was to yeah. balance this kind of money what was available here when you look at the cross sections of McDougal or Abbasi so these cross section are more or less taking into account only up to the Eocene and not the uh, not the Murray and when you look at the deformation style Murray is equally deformed and that shows that that was Murray was there when this deformation propagated through this area. So mm -hmm. that was the reason why we have to do some modifications. And uh, so in, the, in this way, yes, Murray is here and uh, we tried to balance it. Some geometries were not really nice in this way, but, uh, you know, you have to make some decisions to, to come, up with, uh, come up with some structural style. The second part of the question is why deformation is switching back and forth in the in the in the stratigraphic wedge. So earlier, what we had the idea of stratigraphic wedges was like this simple idea that the deformation propagate from hinterland toward the foreland. But in, for example, in the more we understand about it, there are several factors for that. For example, in this case, we have double D column here. And then we think that some sort of normal faults are available here that somehow accrete the major chunk of stratigraphic um, section into the deforming wedge. And when you switch the deformation and you bring in more material, then you have to create some sort of taper to actually take the deformation forward. But I, other thing I have seen in Pakistan in, in that sense is that... Uh, in that case, like how far you are from the from the uh, from the edge of the uh, edge of the cratonic India in that case, like what we have seen in uh, let's say in central Himalaya, the restored sections show around 700 kilometer of shortening, but what you see in Pakistan is just 250 kilometer of shortening in 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 this uh, region. So. Obviously, uh, these kind of things are there, which are kind of uh, uh, putting the influence on how the deformation is going to propagate. For example, in this part, when you look at uh, Potohar, there's a huge like uh, Peshawar basin at the trailing end of it. So the deformation is more or less propagating towards south. But when you look into the Indus and Texas, we have almost the same uh, kind of edges for the appetite fission track around three, four million years just in the south of the man mantle thrust. So this this shows that there are some pre-existing controls in 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 the in in the basin that are influencing the this pattern in back and forth kind of uh, of propagation for in the stratigraphic wedge. So so salt double decolment angle to the basement segmentation in the wedge. So there are a couple of processes that are going on. So and the uh, like in your paper, for example, you worked on it and the major uh, uh, work was the role of the normal faulting in kind of concentration of the shortening on the on the thought rate. So, so this is one of the factors. And then there are other factors. So how, how uh, better we understand all of them together is somehow the answer uh, in this case. Yeah. Thank okay, you. Uh, Hamad, sorry, sorry, one yeah. one last question. Like, yeah, sure. Uh, basically, when you create that ramp in the southern cohort area, so mm. that ramp in that ramp region, do you do you think that there's a you know proterozoic salt horizon there is or what you're trying to do that because the way the things are gliding on that ramp. Uh, you mean for the silver range? Yes, for the silver ranges. So. Uh, uh, what I have here in this uh, cross section, yeah. So what I model originally at that point was uh, a kind of uh, really simple kind of thin-skinned structure on top of it, and then I had this uh, everything going down in that this way. So what we have, what we know from the surface geology is that. Uh, what we have is that the salt is only exposed as the diapers along the Kalabakh fault zone, which you have also seen when you travel along the road 
roads from uh, from the town of Kalabakh towards Shakardara along the roadside. You can see that. What was uh, here down here now? Earlier, like when you look at the model of cotton in Kui, they said there's no. Uh, saw that only in the in, the, but I think that uh, when I live active uh, roof thrust modeling, so I think that even if salt is here, it doesn't make uh, much difference in this case. If you have a kind of a normal fault here, that this is giving a kind of uh, pre-existing uh, barrier for something to grow a structure on top of it. And in all these uh, uh, forward models, what you see is that more or less the concern, the deformation is concentrated on this fault. This, this fault is not moving from here from last. Really, yeah. Yeah, I agree with that. You, I know that there's a, actually in the beginning there there should be a normal faulting, and that normal faulting actually reactive, not actually the normal fault, but the strata on top of it is being glided over it. But my question is because you are showing something yellow there, is that yellow is a weak horizon? Is it something? Yeah. I think is it what? This, I, I don't this know. One? This my one. This one. Question is, is it the Eo Cambrian salt horizon or something else? So this, so must this, be a weak this is just a marker horizon for like uh, uh, this was the Raoul Pindi group, and this is just the Mesozoic to show the deformation. Like when we propagate down uh, to to give a kind of impression how the deformation is going. If you put all the horizons, this get really complicated. No, no. What my question is is it it is very difficult because these uh, Mesozoic rocks are all you know. A platform sequences, and I don't think so. They could provide, a, you know, a weak, a weak decolment in order to glide the things easily toward the foreland. Anyway, yeah. I'm so take a lot of time. Yeah, sorry. Uh, no, no, no problem. So decolma is not in the Mesozoic, so it is coming down on the, the base of the Paleozoic, actually. So this okay. was just a, a marker horizon to show kind of the deformation patterns in there. So the decolma is not below the Mesozoic. It is uh, above the basement on the crystalline sedimentary interface. It was salt there. I, I can't answer this. Was salt there or not? But what mm -hmm. I can understand is that uh, what we understand from the seismic as well is that this basement decolma is basically at the interface of uh, basement and the strati uh, and the stratigraphy above. So, so this yeah, is uh, yeah. that. Yeah. I agree with that. My question, because why I did ask these questions, because when I did my modeling, so I mm -hmm. saw those all those kind of things. If you have you have a strong unit, it does, the things doesn't move. If you introduce yeah. the salt horizon, things move. Even in yeah. the presence of the ramp, this, uh, you know, the component rock units are not supposed to be moving unless and until you have a weak horizon there. Anyway, thank you so yeah. nice of you for the nice presentation oh, and nice I, work. Thank you very much. So we have yeah. a friend from Japan, uh, Hafiz Rahman. Can you please go on uh, with your question? Yes. Hello. Uh, Hello. Thank you very much for a nice presentation, Hamad. Thank you, uh, sir. Uh, it's nice to see you, and maybe you must have uh, woke up early in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, my question is about the, you, you showed a, a column with the ages, top, older, middle, younger, and then older. Can you show that slide? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think this one. This one? Uh, yes, yes, this, yes, this one. Yeah. Uh, so I'm not very well familiar with these uh, areas because uh, I, I, my work is in the northern areas. But here, uh, what's the reason of, of this younger age uh, within the older one? What, what's 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 causing this this kind of uh, pattern there? So so this is uh, something like related with what we have in the when the deformation propagates so the rocks are here they are undisturbed in this part so no exhumation no cooling no new data coming out so mm -hmm. 
when the deformation propagates, so obviously these rocks are uplifted from the base and they are coming up and the strata above is eroding on top of it. So these uh, rocks are now getting new fission tracks, for example, in this case, and helium is trapped into the system. So that's why this, this kind of, uh, let's say, eight to two million years is when these rocks are, or these samples were coming from the subsurface toward the surface. So this was kind of a history for these samples. So that's why the only thing what we had is like what I had in my mind was like when I will, I was uh, in second or third year of my PhD, I was expecting one or two million year at the silver range. And when the 13 million year came out, that was really a nightmare for me. And you can understand a PhD student who has some sort of idea in his mind and something else comes out that is really a kind of freak him out. So then I, uh, what I did is I asked one of my colleagues from University of Peshawar, Mohammed Sajid, to go and bring some more samples. So I brought more samples and I did the analysis and I did analysis again for the appetite fission track uh, ages and the ages were again the same and now i had the choice to see like should this ages uh, these ages are like they have the reproducibility and that that was coming out but the only problem was they were not fitting well with the paleomagnetic strata uh, or the paleomagnetic chronology either i I understand it or, or, or I, I explain my data or no. So then I, when I look closely and I see that, okay, the Raul Pindi group is missing in the server and there is an angular unconformity. And then uh, what I have seen further is uh, from this uh, PhD thesis of Aftahar Alam, that in the Surgar range, what you see is that there is scarcer limestone and on top of it, you have the uh, metachatic formation, which has the class from the older older rocks. And then on top of it, we have the Nagari formation. So these were kind of uh, uh, clues that, that there must be something happening before Nagari formation came into the basin. If they were not deformed, these... these uh, these uh, strata or this class should not be there. So this is something Burbank did in uh, in, in uh, salt rain. Then because they have uh, uh, so they have uh, collected uh, Tobra granites from from the younger strata uh, in in in, 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 in uh, of the unconformity that shows that the salt rain was uplifted for around five million years. So this was something like uh, in in this. Uh, in this uh, uh, chronology, I came out with that. Okay. So I, I understand like this is not an easy <laughs> thing to understand like uh, in, in the out in the four lane 13 million years. So this was one of the question my PhD uh, reviewer Peter von Beek asked me in my uh, PhD and I asked him if this was two million years, my PhD would have uh, completed six months earlier, actually. So yeah, this is how it is. Thank you very much. OK. Thank you. Uh, Bob, can we take more questions or, uh, you know? <laughs> Bob? OK. Go ahead. Can you go on, please, with your question? Uh, yeah, thank you so much for uh, giving me a chance once again. Uh, my fabulous job, but you know, this uh, Thermochronology and indirect data sets are always uh, questionable, and these techniques are continuously evolving as we are moving in time. Uh, my direct observations in the field work that I've been working in this area from quite a time now, the age of MBT uh, could be quite older just because uh, the deposition of Eocene, I'll take you to further older rock units. The Eocene basin, Kuhart basin, is a well-established Eocene basin, uh, which has almost 1,500 meters thick Eocene sequence. But as you move to the north of the MBT, the Eocene is either missing, either you have the deposition of Murray formation, Miocene rocks right on top of the Tala formation, or they are very thin to the level of three meters and four meters. What we presume 
is that the uplift on the MBT has also controlled the deposition of Eocene in this region. That could be dated back to 45 million years. Now, uh, you know, uh, bringing this uplift to as young as 12 million years is highly questionable. How would you justify the deposition of Eocene along the MBT? You are in the Kohart Basin and then you cross the MBT and you enter into the uh, Tira or Xai range and all of a sudden Eocene is missing. Now this MBT has some controls on the deposition of even the Eocene strata, not the, let's not talk about the molasses. So how could we uh, flatten it down at that time when the Eocene was being deposited and then uplifted later on without it controlling the tone of stratigraphy? I'm afraid I had this question. So, uh, uh, so uh, what we have is that, yes, you have the observations about that. What the data we need is like from some method that show ages, for example. Looking at this uh, map of uh, Di Pietro, for example, Ali Torab has worked in this area and he produced uh, ages from uranium lead on apatites. And he also brought out ages for the apatite fission track and some zircon helium and these ages. So what he had is that 27 million years for the MCT and then around 10 million years for the MBT. And 10 million years is the kind of age that was uh, frequently quoted in all the literature along the Himalaya, not only in Pakistan. This is a major thrust going for 2,000 kilometers. Uh, yeah. So th all these studies are bringing out continuously reproducing the same ages, like 10 to 12 million years. Like then, for example, if we are asking about MBT at 45 million years, then what we need to do is that we this should be the collision zone in that case, because uh, other than that, we don't have any age constraints for that. What you are basically asking is something related to the tectonostratigraphy. How was the basin uh, stratigraphy at that point. For example, I have shown here in this part in the late Paleozoic that uh, we had the normal faulting in the late Paleozoic time, which is exerting the control on the accumulation of the incoming sediments in the pre-Himalayan era. And when you see closely on the Eocene, what you see is that the Eocene is more or less concentrated in this line, in, in this part, for example. Yeah, so this is where you have in, in the Galiath region, you have the Eocene uh, strata, you have Eocene almost here in the Eastern Salt Range and all the way it goes down into the Suleiman and Kirtha. Yeah, but you don't find any Eocene in this part in the, in the Syntaxis region. So this has something to do with the pre-existing geometry of the basin. So. If you think, for example, that the MBT was active at uh, somehow 45 million years, that will be something really new for me to know. And if uh, some data is there to support that, that would be really interesting to look at, actually. Uh, no, Hamad, actually, I'm not referring it to, to be as old as like MBT evolving around for 45 million years. No, it's not the case. But, you know, the deposition of Eocene there might be some kind of uplifting uh, being started because looking at the Kurum group rocks and Cretaceous nap rocks and their superposition in the northwestern margin of the Himalayas, uh, these Kurum group rocks also refer to uh, some very old ages because I am uh, um, referring to direct methods, direct going to the field and observing the strata. So if you so, even uh, look at the investment of the Kurum so, group rocks. So they, how you know about the uh, ages of those rocks? How you know about the, the, those are Eocene? How you know about them? The, those, those are established for the ages of the rocks. For example, oh. the, 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 uh, according uh, to some math, biostratigraphy uh, or through some yeah, chronology, uh, actually. It has been reported by, the, uh, uh, you know, uh, biostratigraphy and sequence stratigraphy and all these techniques have evolved. These are Eocene and uh, Miocene or whatever the age of the rocks are. 
But referring to things uh, associating them with the faulting and the deformation process, there are still uh, questions about these uh, uh, ages and the deposition of the strata controlled by the tectonic evolution of this part is still a question and needs to be addressed. Um, so uh, let's hope, yeah, this is how uh, science evolves. This is how data sets come in and counter arguments come in and this is how the uh, overall understanding of the region evolves. It's a great, uh, remarkable work. You. Yeah, so Bob, he Thanks said this much. thing in uh, in architecture art ranges where you, he talks about this part where we had this Eocene on top of the Precambrian rocks as well. So definitely if there is a basin, something is filling the basin and how we interpret it is uh, something like uh, that comes out. The, the basin geometry is exerting the control, what is coming into the basin and how it is distributed into the basin. Obviously, that is the case. Bravo, bravo. Good work. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, do we have another question? Yeah, Faisal? Yeah, Faisal. Yeah, sorry. Um, I think, yeah, uh, Gohar uh, Rahman asked, you know, that um, but the thing is that that is that is uh, that is I think it should be established that um, MBT is post uh, Miocene age I would say, and the other thing is that uh, referring to why there is a uh, Eocene missing and all those kind of things. So this because I've been working in Chirat ranges, some of my MSP uh, guys are working in those areas. So what we I personally think that it's not a one sequence event happening in these areas. There are multiple episodes happening, and also when you look into these cooling ages. Some like there's been a chance that how quickly the rocks been brought to the surface. So that's also those things are also important to be you know to to keep in mind. You know, sometimes if you bring something very quickly, so it means it has less. It it will definitely going going to give you young ages, I would say, and those which are being gradually move up, that's going to give you you know older ages. Am I am I right like that? Yeah, so Peter Zeitler has one age from yeah. this uh, in his 1985 uh, data yeah. set from the architecture art ranges, and it was about 27 million years. So it was yeah. more or less uh, uh, kind of similar to what we have for the MCT in this mm -hmm. sense. So, yeah. so those these, those things are like you have to also consider those things as well. So there are multiple stages events happening, and also how like one structure might be exhumating very quickly compared to others. So those variation in ages you can expect in that area. But yeah, this, this is controversy that how you are getting older ages in that again, in the yeah. south and why it is getting younger toward the north when you, you know, coming back. Yeah. So this is like uh, yeah. when we talk about segmentation of the tectonic wedge, for example, yeah, yeah, like true. in, yeah. in, the, in this San Texas, we have three to four million years ages. So know, this is yeah. the most northern part of what is happening. And you have a lot of concentration of earthquakes in this region. So that yes, the deformation sir. has switched back here. Yeah. And obviously some pre-existing controls are there on this. So, so. I think it's the, how quickly you are bringing things to the surface. That's, that's important. Yeah. OK. So uh, I think it's time to conclude. Uh, Bob uh, just mentioned that uh, there is some problem with the weather. Uh, that's probably because of uh, what he is unable to attend continuously. He would be there continually. So uh, thank you, Hamad. Thank you for uh, your wonderful talk. Thank you so much. Uh, it was really interesting. Uh, so the, the future talks uh, in this series, uh, the upcoming one is on March 24th uh, uh, from uh, Doug Burbank from University of uh, Southern California. And after that, on March 31st, we have a speaker from Punjab University, Muhammad Akbar Khan. Um, uh, we just like to extend our invitation uh, for potential speakers. Uh, because as we discussed, this is an open-ended um, seminar series and anyone who finds himself or herself interested in giving a talk uh, is more than welcome. So I would uh, now 
say goodbye to everyone. Uh, thanks, uh, Irfan. I think you can. Sure. You can. Sorry, Irfan. You can. You know, uh, I will try my best to you know share uh, my work on uh, Potwar Plateau as well, okay. the stage modeling. But let's see right. when, when I'm gonna give you. I will. Yeah, yeah. You can. You can let us know. So we will uh, put you uh, in a slot, obviously. Yeah, basically. Uh, yeah. Let me see when I because I'm going back okay. to probably Pakistan. I don't know how it's gonna happen. Uh, depends on you. Obviously, we have few speakers in line already. Yeah, keep in Bob mind has already, yeah, yes. Bob has already, you know, uh, ha, ha dedicated uh, days for that. So if you just let us know in the email, and uh, we will definitely be very no. much happy to, to, to have you in uh, as a speaker. So okay. thank you, everyone. Uh, thank you for uh, joining us. It's becoming a wonderful series. Uh, I'll see you again on uh, coming Wednesday. Good night. Yeah. Yeah, thank you very uh, much from, from this part of the world. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you all very, very much. Hey,